worship, worship, worship. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my God is yes. A tu tomba me gusta la estadi, a stick, amb el meu amic, el meu germà català, el Marc Segarra. Pessoal, pessoal, estou falando em catalão aqui, mas o podcast, a, gente, a gente fala em espanhol, geralmente, mas o podcast de hoje será gravado em inglês com este que é um dos maiores empresários internacionais que eu conheço, Mr. Mark Segarra. How are you, Thanks man? for having me, man. No, of course, this is your home. <laughs> Everywhere I am in the world, we always much. have a space for you. Tell the people what the hell you do for a living. What the hell do you do for a living? Well, uh, it's a very simple answer. Um, so we started seven years ago uh, in a sports management and marketing agency dedicated to helping uh, the biggest and largest soccer names in the world. It doesn't matter if they are leagues, associations, players to reach emerging soccer markets. That was Which, United States is the number one emerging soccer markets in the world, right? I would say it is top one. Why did you have this idea seven years ago? Actually, you came to the U.S. even longer, like almost 10 years, right? 10 years, yes. 10 uh, years in the U.S. already. You were actually a big part of it. Uh, because you All right, were, so <laughs> let, let's stop this and let's go back. How did you meet this crazy guy here in 2010? Uh, well, uh, I, I came back from studying in Italy, in Bologna. And um, then when I came back to Barcelona, there was a guy sitting on my, on my seat in the university. And I was like, hey, what the fuck are you doing in my seat? Like, and I was just kidding. And uh, from there, he just reacted a little bit like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I said, of course, I'm just kidding. So... I borrowed my seat, I, I s sat down right next to him, and from there we become very good friends. And then, the week after, we're playing soccer in the same team. <laughs> exactly. For the university. So tell him, uh, how did you manage to leave a country like Spain, where entrepreneurship is not, at least then, wasn't a really big thing? People were like, oh, I want to get a job in a multinational company. And all of a sudden, you're like, no, I'm going to be a businessman, and I'm going to be a businessman not in my country, in the best country in the world. I think the, the biggest part of it is like when you surround yourself with international people, you, you allow yourself to see more than what you have experienced during your life. So I got to meet a lot of Americans that studied abroad in Barcelona, and from there, the, the idea of just moving out there to, to do my master's just by getting on a scholarship with, uh, with soccer. So you saw me playing, we played together, and you suggest, brother, you have the level to, to come play in America. So I was less really like, let's go. Then at that, at that time, uh, my best friend and partner, uh, Alex Isern, uh, he was studying at UBC, British Columbia. Uh, in Vancouver. In, yeah, in Vancouver. In, yeah. And he told me, man, let's go to the US to play soccer. And that's how we ended up there, um, with a full scholarship, playing in a D1 school in South Carolina, Winthrop. And so uh, coming to the U.S. as an athlete opened a lot of horizons for you as a professional. Like, can you uh, explain to us, like, how different is uh, the sports mentality and, like, well, going to a university in America versus in Spain? Uh, well, I, I consider that the university in Spain is tougher than the university oh, really? in the U.S. Yes, because here in the U.S. the education system is very systematic. Right. It's all based out of tests. Uh, the, the way you develop your brain your, or your mindset when, when, you're, when you're studying, it's completely different because the tests are different, the professors are different, right, right. the mentality is different, the culture is different. So for me, it was tougher in Spain. Um, but uh, the, the one, one of the greatest things I, I learned here in, in America is like you can achieve everything that you want uh, or you just put yourself into it. And also the, the competition. Everybody likes to compete. Compete to yeah, do man. better and better and better. And people is just much more, I don't know, honest at, at, at some certain levels, yeah. In America? In America, yeah. Oh, wow. I... I would never expect you to say that. 
No. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's just my, my honest opinion. So uh, you played two years as a D1 athlete. You're a champion. And when we get to our senior year in university, you remember that part of my life when I, I migrated from the University of Pennsylvania to Wall Street? It's a time when we, uh, we don't know what we're going to do with our lives. Exactly. And, like, how did you surf through it? Like, I remember I was trying to get you a job in Wall Street, and you're like, no, nah, man. I want to do, I want to play, I want to work with soccer. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> how, how, did, like, how did it all work in your mind? I know that, that's, that's part of, of growing, right? At the end, any of the decisions that I had at the time, just, they had a risk. Right, so would I rather take the risk for myself or the risk for somebody else? So I would like, I just graduated fresh out of college. I thought that there was an opportunity to, to just fill a gap of knowledge, soccer knowledge here in the US and insider access. And then there was also a big, big gap to, fi uh, to, to fill for European personalities and clubs and associations to continue to expand their brand overseas. So I was like, let's do it. Let's, let's go ahead and just, just fill that gap. So it was like a win-win situation. Like the Americans would win and the Europeans would win with the bridge you created. Exactly. That's, that was the whole idea. Just building a pipeline that can leverage any sort of assets between both markets. You know? So like I, on my end, the way I view you as if you were on the right place at the right time, and from the right background, and from the right city. Can you explain to us what was going on in the soccer world in 2010, 2011, and like what people wanted back then? Oh, I mean, back then, the, the soccer team, well, the, my team, FC Barcelona, was at his <laughs> highest spike, you know, most of the... Uh, just They're close. winning everything. Yeah, exactly. They, they won everything. Most of our closest friends that, that just play in the academy with, with my younger brother um, were in the first team. Uh, I also come from a background where my granddad was one of the greatest captains of the history of Barcelona. So, What's, what's your grandfather's name? Juan Sagarra. Juan Sagarra. Yeah. Uh, for people who don't understand, Juan Sagarra was like the Bellini in Brazil. Uh, the captain of like uh, a very successful team in the 1950s and 60s, and that was his grandpa. So like you grew up, I, I saw like you had pictures with Romario when you were like four years old, six years old. Like, yeah, that, that that that's the access. in the stadium. That's like you had access. access that, you grew up there, right? That, well, the, the 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 family, you know, the the lack of just growing uh, surrounded of a soccer family from my granddad, from my dad, from my brother. And from there, I, I also play, but I was not, well, I was good enough, but at that time, I was not mature enough to understand yeah. the opportunity Guys, of becoming no, a professional no. like, player. This yeah. kid was like one of the best number nines I've ever seen play, but he's a crazy motherfucker. He's crazy. He's a crazy dude. But, and <laughs> yeah, but well, like, I mean, he I, was I, very, very fucking good. He would have played. Not crazy. I mean, he would have played in the Champions League nowadays. I like what most of the people like at that time. Right? What? Party. Party. Um, you <laughs> but you know? didn't drink then. You didn't know no, alcohol, didn't but he drink, liked party. He was yeah. like, oh, he, you didn't like authority. Because coaches, they want to be your boss, and you're like, no, I want to uh, do my that, own thing. Yeah, that was a, uh, also a problem. But, but your brother, like, like, I remember your brother's from the same generation as if, uh, as a lot of the greatest Uh, youngsters of Barcelona time, like Thiago Alcantara, Jonathan Dos Santos, who else was in your brother's time? Andrew Fontas. Fontas, Bartra, Muniesa, Muniesa. Carlos Planas. Sergio Roberto, no, he's younger. No, Sergio Roberto also was playing with my brother. He was one year And up. your brother was the captain of the exactly. whole, whole thing. Montoya. Montoya. See, I, I consider one of the biggest talent pools. Generations, like, yeah, yeah the 91 of the, generation of Barcelona. I think it was one of the best of all times. And your brother was like, well, he was very well liked by these people. And I remember when I moved to Barcelona, these kids who are today, like, stars, they used to look up to you. 
Like, because you're the big brother of the captain. And you like, you know all the girls, you know all the parties. Like, people respected you. And you had no money, no fame. But like, all these famous people, they respected you. How did you manage that? I don't know. I, I don't think money the, do not make people, right? So, I, I, I consider that I was just a good brother, a good personality. Always with my heart completely open to to the people that is around me. And that's what really makes the difference, you know? It doesn't matter how deep your pockets are, but how big is your, your heart, your heart is, you know? And how, what, what's the power of just making people feel in their heart, you know? I remember you do, did a, like, you came to our mastermind group and talked, and like, you won a lot of people through, uh, uh, the, the three things people like the most, soccer, Entertainment and girls. Yeah. And that's basically what you did then. I mean, yes, uh, that was like, uh, I call it the triangle of the Bermudas. No? <laughs> <laughs> the Bermuda triangle of yeah, relationships, triangle. Yeah, exactly. of business relationships. I mean, at that time, like, and, and I explained it when, when we were at the, the mastermind uh, in, in Lithuania. In we were in Lithuania. Palanca, 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 Palanca Lithuania. Palanca, Lithuania, yeah. So I was like, at that time, I consider myself a worm, right? Um, okay. A worm because I, I, I was in a triangle where you had to somehow evolve to really just make it to, to where, where we are right now, right? Just being a professional in the sports industry where all this ecosystem or at, like people around you tries you to, to do business with, right? But at the time, it was a completely different thing. Like, at the time, people trusted me because uh, I was a good person, that I was giving them access to, to certain things that were very limited in Barcelona. True. True. And from there, that's how you evolve. You know, I was a, a worm at the time. Now and you're an anaconda. No, a butterfly. You know? <laughs> no, I'm a butterfly. It's, it's, that's, that's the way I see it. That's the way I see it. And then... Um, so these people looked up to you and like you created a good network in the football world that like you used that. I mean, you, you when you came to America, you're like, hey, I think I can connect this world with this world. What was your first step as a businessman in America? Like the first money you make after after college? Like, Well, actually, during college, <laughs> I was making money just uh, cleaning lights of the cars. In all the car dealerships, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that in South Carolina there was such a huge like secondhand car dealerships. And right. With with my friend Mason Labalette, we were just going there to to clean. Uh, oh, to I didn't know that. You, yes. you were like that. That was the first. Then I, I decided to coach in one of the local teams, Discovery Kids, Young Kids, Kids Discovery Soccer Club. I was 22 at the time, and I saw that the structure. And the education that they were providing to the kids was not what I was used to, right? So, and I think that will be much better, right? So, you took it right there, yeah. So, like. so that that's where I first envisioned the opportunity. Like, wow, like all these kids are are just investing all this money to receive a soccer education that could be much better, right? That was my first, like, wow, like there is a big opportunity. So from there, we did um, a business develop, development um, competition in college. Oh, uh, like a, one of those like entrepreneurship classes. Exa- and exactly. So write a, yeah. we present the project in front of a like, investor's board. And uh, one of the main guys from Bank of America was like, hey, guys, I really like your idea. We, we actually earned the first award. And he connected us with uh, Mac Lackey, a uh, senior entrepreneur from from Charlotte, North Carolina, very dedicated to soccer. And then I get in touch with him. I went to his house. And uh, from there, we started the business. He was like, well, everybody says... Well, actually, that's a funny story. You know, we were at his house. You know, he has pictures of Maradona, Pelé, all the big guys, right? And uh, Pictures <laughs> with him or with, pictures with him. of them? No, with, with, okay. yeah, with him. We were in that... In a, Big, big mansion. First time seeing a big mansion in my life. So I woke up to there, but, and uh, we started talking, and I said, well, like, I, 
I'm very close to certain people. And yeah, everybody says the same, you know, well, like, I can prove it to you, no problem. So at that time, one of his favorite players was the Alcantara. Oh, no. Was he at Bayern or was he at, 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 at Barcelona? At, at, at Barcelona, yeah. So at, I just ring him on FaceTime and he answered the phone. And then from that time, actually, that's a, like a true fact that I never disclosed that uh, because uh, that call, that, that guy just got He's my, like, take my money. Hey, I'm my, investing like, you. The whole, the whole trust. Because you're young, yeah. And like people lie. I'm like, that, all right, that, this kid is yeah, lying. I, I think the, that's one of the biggest problems, not just here in America, but all over the world, you know, like everybody wants to pretend something that they are not. Everybody lives out of the credit. Everybody is over-promising, under-delivering. Under delivery. And that's the, the, the banana theory that I always tell you, you know? Like, I mean, th there is three types of people in the this world. This is the best know? theory I've ever heard. I mean, it's, and that applies to everything, you know? There is the regular guy that they say that they have a 10-inch banana, you know? And you pull their pants down, and it's a 10-inch banana, right? Great. Then you have the, the phantasmas, the, the guys that says... Yeah, I have this and that, boom, boom, boom. And you pull the pants down. And then down. you pull the pants down and it's a little peanut, you know? <laughs> and then you have the, the type of people, I, I think those are the most successful ones, you know? It's like under-promise, under-delivering. No. Under-promise, over-delivering. Over-delivering. They exactly. say, hey, I have a... 10-inch banana. I have a 10-inch banana, but you pull their pants down and it's a 20-inch <laughs> banana. That 10-inch difference is a big positive impact. So that's... Um, That's what happened. So yeah. So um, like Mark, one one story you don't know that my first job in Wall Street, I kind of got it because of you. Think about it. Look, my the guy who was interviewing me, he was a Tottenham fan, right? And it was in 2010. And there's a guy who was playing for Tottenham in 2010. One of our friends, Giovanni dos Santos. Yes. How did I meet Giovanni dos Santos? In one of uh, our get-togethers. Through you yeah. and through Eric. So I have a picture with Giovanni Dos Santos, and I had a shirt by him. So this same guy who interviewed me, he was like, yeah, whatever, you're, you're a bullshitter. I did exactly what you did, but I didn't call Giovanni. I pull up a picture, and I show them, hey, that's me and Giovanni, and hey, that's like his jersey sign. And he's like, wow. Can you get my kids? And I'm like, of course. And I got the shirt signed by, and like sent it to the kids. And the same way you got no, an investor, no, I got my I first know, job. I know, I know, I know, I know. You're talking about Shane? No, no, no. It no, wasn't no? Shane. It was, okay. uh, it was uh, Matthew Hickman. Okay. Oh, because Shane is also a... Shane, yeah. Shane was my mentor, funny. but like he didn't hire me. Matthew hired me. He was a Tottenham fan. Wow. And he was like, wow, I, this is just everybody... Says that and like, and then I'm like, hey, no, and that's part of the triangle, you know. Like, there is very few people in the world that do not like soccer, but there right. is a huge amount of people that love soccer, and just connecting or using that or leveraging that that sort of connection and network, it's very important, you know. Uh, but always with uh, good intentions, you have to be always with good. True, and it's, as you said before, it's not really about money because there's like a lot of rich, rich, rich people who would like, wow, they, they put the soccer players as like, wow. There is things that money can buy, and that's what really moves the world nowadays, you know, like... Access. It, yeah, access. Access, like legitimate access, you know. There are things that, I mean, you want to get a jersey from... Very important player. Not everybody can get that. It doesn't matter you how can. much money you have, right? You but there is people that can do that, right? Or you want to go see a private training for, for a soccer team. There is people that will pay a lot of money for that. True. But money won't give you access to that. So, yeah. and there is a thousand other things that, that at the end, it doesn't matter how, how wealthy you are. Do you end, remember the first gift you gave to me after you left to London? That was something that was very special to me. You, you left from London. You, you came from London back to Barcelona. You gave me one gift. 
What was the gift? I forgot. It was a Chelsea jersey signed by. Oh yes, we were with a uh, well, Fernando Torres. Drogba and, and Torres <laughs> signed the jersey, and you gave it to me. I was yeah. like, no, because at that time we had a close friend playing there, Uriel Romeo. Ah, yeah, he was playing for Chelsea then. Yeah, true, true. So go, going back to your own story, uh, this guy McLacky, he, he believed in you, he invested in you, and then what you did with it. So at that time we become part-time uh, part-time employees for his company that was named Kick. It was a registration platform um, that helped well just all the registration back end from Soccer.com and US Club. It was built uh, from from McLucky. So he wanted to to expand his his registration platform through other federations. So we help him with that. We connect him with players. And at that time, the other hours of our day were dedicated to building ISL. So, Which uh, is Iser, Segarra, Segarra, and Lucky, Lucky, and International Sports Leadership. Oh, so it's, 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 yeah, the, it's the same double way. meaning, yeah. So, and then ISL was growing too fast, you know. Uh, we were just taking spaces in, in Kicks headquarters. Um, and that's how everything started. Uh, just we were at college, still at college. We we did some summer camps for for kids with a white brand. So oh, we use our okay. we we use our. Um, you remember? I forgot it, Barcelona soccer camp. It was yeah. like a white label. It wasn't really FC Barcelona, but you used exactly. the name Barcelona as a city because you brought coaches from Cornellà. Exactly. From, it was white, 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 white level summer camp with the name. Of Barcelona um, by bringing top level coaches from Barcelona, not from FC Barcelona, and from there we catch up the the, the eye from from FC Barcelona, and then that's when we started doing summer camps, academies, and soccer tourism uh, trips. How did you become the number one partner of SC Barcelona in such a big market as the United States? I would say hours, like hours, hours of work, of work, of just putting our face in front of thousands of families. Like, I would say, yeah, it's like everybody says, you know, here in the U.S., like that part of my life that where you have to hustle to really just, just really get where you have to get, you know. So we were just handling flyers in the parking lots. We were just driving all over the place to to make sure that we meet with with uh, different coaches around the nation so they can host our camps in their facilities. And a very big fact was that at that time, my, my business partner and, and, and best friend Alex, we say, yeah, let's, we like to compete against each other, right? Because we know that when once we compete against each other, both get better, like yeah, Cristiano and like, Messi. Uh, They're it's like, like, if I don't allow my friend to beat me, I know I'm going to do my best. At the end, it's, you're, you're, you're sharing the same goal, that it's right, right. reaching the peak of the mountain. So, and we all just get our own ways. But the most important thing that once we compete against each other is when we, have, we deliver the best of the best. I remember you had a map and you had to like, oh, this city, we have, I need a cap in this city. Exactly. The first, four, city. The first four cities were all just, I, I choose them because... Charlotte? It, it, no, no, no. I mean, he, like, he's a very like analytical, strategic, super like organized person. And he was like, okay, I just gonna organize for summer camps in the surrounders of, of Charlotte. So he picked Greensboro, Raleigh, Charlotte, and Rock Hill, South Carolina. And I was like, I let myself go by my feelings. And I wanted to do Louisville, Kentucky because that where, that's where I played my last game. Oh, you play against the Louisville Cardinals in the NCAA tournament. Exactly. Then it was Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama. because my best friend in college, one of my best friends in college was from there, Mason Laballette. Then the other one was Knoxville, because Tennessee. Tennessee, because one of my favorite friends, girlfriends in the world was living there at the time at Knoxville University, UT, uh, Stephanie McEnroy, ah, yeah, and Lauren Hakim yeah. and Corey Quinn. They're, they used to be in... Um, 
In Barcelona, yeah. Exactly. So I was like, yeah, just Tennessee, a good way to Tennessee. see them and visit that city. Then the other one was um, Nashville, because my dad loved Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. And um, I wanted to go there and just take a picture to, like, of that statue that they have there in the city. In this approach, were you still white label or were you already a partner of FC Barcelona? At the time, that was the first time it was white label still. It was white label. White label. And from there, we just had like around 1,000 people registering to our camps. And then that's when we present the project to FC Barcelona. Oh, and they were like, hey, Barcelona, I have this. I have this With many With a white people. run, we, we got to that certain number of players. Uh, we believe that we could do something similar or even better with, with, with FC, uh, FC Barcelona brand. And that's how everything started. And from there, we, for the next four years, we just continue to grow, opening new cities, um, ex just using all the resources that the U.S. provides to you, you know, sports, com sports commission, public facilities, parks and recs, soccer clubs. So from there, every, everything exploded. Establish our base with summer camps, academies, and soccer trips. And that's when we start having a lot of attention from other clubs. And oh, and so it wasn't just Barcelona. You, you were like a white label company to do camps. And all you had to do is like put other... The thing, the, the thing I, I, I believe, of course, the brand is super important. But I consider that execution, it's, it has to be at the same level of the brand. Because what happened for the last 20 years here in the U.S., like, you have the biggest soccer brands coming in. You know, they come with the flag. Hey, I'm this club, I'm this club. I don't want to disclose the name of the clubs. You yeah, know, but they just, just put a sticker, hey. Yeah, and it's like Logos Lab, you know, like, and that's not enough. You know, you have to have a good operational team that operates your brand in the U.S. You have to have coaches good, too, right? good marketing, good coaches that in order to just... To showcase the, your your credibility, you know, it's the best way to to hey, I'm authentic. I'm not one of those guys that came 20 years ago. Like, we are doing something that is very unique, and I want to base it out of all the parents' trust. You know, we are here to provide something different, to provide that international lack of soccer that the U.S. at the time was missing, and that was our goal. You know, like, and that's the way we did it. Like. It's execution over brand, 100%. So at, before the pandemics, you were a company of how many academies you had? And academies like fixed academies. Around 10, more or less, yeah. 10? Even in San Diego. I remember you were opening one in San Diego. Is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. Nice. Then Barcelona Academies, you did the trips. I remember you used to take a lot of kids to Barcelona. Yeah, right? we, we take around 5,000 people a year. 5,000 People per year from the U.S. to Barcelona, they practice. What, what do they do in Barcelona? They go there for 10 days. With we, their families? With their families. We, we give them access to the training facility of FC Barcelona with FC Barcelona official coaches. They get to meet and I remember some of Neymar the players. Came, Neymar came, uh, Suarez. Suarez came. So, yeah, so... That we, um, um, t -t, you know, like, I remember, like, you, you brought some of these players. Uh, Hafinha, when he was playing there, you brought Hafinha, some of Barca these players. Yeah, the first one. So... Um, best seats in the stadium, then so it's a whole experience, experience. It's an immersed experience in the Spanish soccer culture and lifestyle. So that that's that was our niche program. So from there we were like, we had several teams contacting us. Hey, we would like to do the same that you're doing with FC Barcelona, and that's where we expand into other business lines, right? So because the way our business was set up, like. We could do exactly what we were doing for FC Barcelona with other teams. Copy paste. Copy paste. You know, but not all the brands have the power or strength that FC Barcelona has, and we don't have that connectivity, that natural connectivity of being Catalan, being raised in Barcelona, having your grandpa being exactly. one of those so idols it, of that team. So for us, it was like our eyes were only for Barcelona, right? At that time, so um, from there we were like the only way we can grow is continue growing our business into other locations, into other countries, uh, doing the same, replicating the same, uh, Central America with Costa Rica, in Asia right now. So the idea was to 
replicate the same with the same brand, but then you take everything and you say, well, I can do that for any club in the world that it has a good brand and that you can sell something more than the brand. You know, with FC Barcelona, you can sell the brand and you can sell the style of play and you can also sell the players that they have on the team, right? Not all the teams in the world have yes. that, you know? Uh, you have teams that they have amazing players, they have an amazing brand, but they don't have an, a very, like, a specific style of play. So, and that's important, you know? It's not, it's not just what, what you get, it's the process. For me, it's the process... To get there is what makes the, the product special. Right. And that's what Barcelona, that, that, what Barcelona has. So, so from there, um, we were having some teams coming. And um, second-tier teams or teams that um, they have good brands, but we were like, why are we getting in the middle of, of something that could really just damage our relationship with FC Barcelona? So right. we decided to start leveraging our network here in the U.S., and in Europe to brokerage sponsorship for, for professional soccer clubs, yeah. uh, helping them to generate revenue by organizing their tours and friendlies matches, and um, just also just connecting our network of influencers with them so they can just raise awareness of their brand without having to invest a huge amount of money. Right, right. So that was a little bit of what we did from there, you know, like, what other ways we have to connect with other clubs without... Okay. So, so we were just tours and friendlies, brokerages, sports, brokerages of sponsorship, and uh, talent management. And that's how we became a like a, 360... Like a holding, yeah. Like a, so basically, you went from being a events company, like you create events. Yeah, event management, brand management. For and me. then you became a, like, a marketing... like. Sports marketing, sports marketing agency. Became, okay, sounds good. So you created friendly. Did you broker friendly uh, friendly yes. games? Like, can you example of like friendly Rens games against Benfica? Benfica, wow. Like uh, we helped Betis on their tour here in the Betis US. Betis came to the US. Yes, they played this United. Joaquin, Cata, Cata, Catanua, Chattanooga. Oh, Joaquin, wow. yes, Bartra were there. It was a fantastic experience. So. For, for us being able to connect the U.S. sports franchises, MLB, NFL, all these amazing culture of sports, and connect it with our culture, the Spanish culture, the soccer culture, it's, it's, it's something very special. Like, oh, I remember you had a picture with Gronkowski and Messi. That was, uh, that was part of the things that once they come to Barcelona, uh, we help them set up all their, their trips, their arrangements with the club, so... And that generates a lot of good content and value because at the end, somehow Barca is on the eyeballs of all the fan base of Gronkowski. Of people, yeah. And Gronkowski is in the eyeballs of all the fan base of FC Barcelona. That it's huge. So it's a win-win for both sides. It's win-win. DeAndre, DeAndre Hopkins too in Houston. Yes, that was uh, one thing that we did a market visit with Luis Suarez in, uh, Suarez in Houston when he was playing with the national team. So we had the opportunity to to set up all those links between the Texans and Suarez, the Rockets. Um, so your thing is not soccer anymore. Like, your sport. It's, it's I mean, still soccer. I, I, I consider that our main base is soccer. But just connecting soccer with other sports and other industries, that's where our future is, you know, because everybody wants to have access to that, 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 that pool. Like, the soccer pool is massive all over the world, you know? Right. Right. Uh, we only talked about like good things so far. I remember you were like you were like a twenty million per year company, which is a lot. It's a little bit then, less, yeah, around fifty. Right, right. And then all of a sudden, uh, COVID hit. COVID How hit do you, as an entrepreneur, with a physical business that depends on travel, depends on events? Those two industries went to hell. How did you reinvent yourself? And why are you still operating? Like, I, like people would have, uh, would have thought, like, oh, Mark is going to go yeah, out of business. Exactly. But you're so, still there. Well, actually, like, it, it, it was a huge hit, not just for us, but everybody in the industry. It, everybody, like, entertainment. There, are, there right. are a lot of companies that went into bankruptcy. Oh, you, you, met, you know people who went into bankruptcy? A lot of companies that went into bankruptcy that are, were doing something similar that probably didn't diversify 
early enough. Early enough to to just somehow combat the heat of, of, of COVID. Oh, okay. But for us, it was like a 50, 55% revenue decrease. So the strategy that we took with, with my friend and partner and with the whole team, you know, we once we talked with Alex, then we shared the, our ideas with the team, with our executive team. And we decided we don't want to fire anybody. We, we wanted to somehow let's just tighten our seat belts, you know, um, Let's somehow reduce our expenses to so we can still live good, but without, you know, just being uh, conservative a little bit, you know, because we all come from, from zero. So for us, just being here and then being here, it's okay. We, we were coming from here, so it was just totally fine for us. Um, and then we had to just... What the hell are we going to do? Yeah, like, how did you so, reinvent yourself there? Digital was a very important piece. Um, just going into the gaming industry, esports industry, connecting all our like esports sp- sp- connections with the esports industry that was huge, especially on the marketing side. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, um, just we decided to build our own marketing branch within ISL to help. Um, I told you we haven't launched it yet, but we were helping just other industries, companies to build their marketing like operations. So we became like their external CMOs, uh, agencies. And then um, what else? Actually, crypto, the crypto collective um, space, um, that's, that's a very important part for us as well. So now, like you started as a... Soccer camps company, white label. And now, can you like describe the operations of ISL today? So first, you still have the Barcelona camps. Of no. course, yeah. No, I, 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 the way I say it, I mean, we can either explain that by dividing everything by services yeah. or by dividing everything by business lines, right? So for me, the, the, way, the way I put it is we have a... Matrix. Matrix team. So we have CEO together with an operational team, the CMO, the CFO, the human resources person, CBO. So all this is structured. Then we have the, the, the other tier of people that is the project managers that just manage all the projects right, right, that we right. have. And then there are certain um, areas on the business that Just go across the sideways, whole, sideways, not exactly. up and down. Exactly. So um, that's a little bit how the company is structured nowadays. And then we divide everything by business line. So we have our events uh, site where we do summer camps, tournaments in uh, the U.S. In the U.S., any sort of like talent IDs that we're doing right now with, with La Liga, the Spanish okay. league, uh, to, to recruit for talent. Then we have the international travel. Which is bringing people to Barcelona or to Manchester. Exactly, or exactly. So, what we did is like um, we do like international travel. So people travel to Spain for tournaments, for trips, for uh, VIP ticket and experiences. Then, that's part of the that's part. Mig was trips. part of the event side. Okay, yeah. events. Then um, from there we have our management area, like uh, like full year programs that are academies, futsal academies. Which the Barcelona yeah, Academy's so the intensities. Whole, yeah, exactly. Austin, Texas in the exactly. Formula One, right? The Formula One track. Exactly. Uh, that we can go back to that once we... Uh, talk yeah. about the Formula One, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, so... Um, well, let's, let's do it later. Yeah, right. so, so, so we don't... So we have events. Events. Like management. Management of full trips. programs. Trips. Then we have marketing. Within marketing, we have... Uh, Just brokering sponsorship for clubs, helping companies uh, build oh, their ecosystem. For example, if I want to sponsor a club exactly. with my with my brand, can you find a exactly. club for me? With influencers, let's say, for example, uh, with Ultimate Gamer, that it's a, right. a community that we help uh, build their, um, an esports community, right? Um, that the whole idea was to, to build the largest esports community in the world. So what we did is we connected some of the biggest influencers in sports, yeah, soccer, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and entertainment to just 
open their network to to build to help build that that community. So we work with Marcelo from Real Madrid, uh, Darko, uh, one of the main characters from The Money Heist, from uh, Casa de Papel, Casa de Papel, Sergio Busquets from from FC Barcelona. So um, that's part of also of our, our marketing operations. So there are different legs within within that those operations. Um, and then from there, the tourism friendlies. Uh, it's a big, big part of our business. So uh, just basically being the middle person to connect uh, teams to play friendlies. So some pay, some that receive the money. You get uh, basically Commission. a cut from that, plus the opportunity to, to coordinate all the logistics for nice, the travel. Nice. And then the last part is, is talent management. Um, oh, so you actually... Uh, broker players exactly. and like that sell players exactly. back and forth. Um, so that we we create a a brand under ISL that it's called Tandem. Tandem, um, where we just manage soccer players from different countries, and from there we we started the esports section. Oh, wow. Not a long time ago, you know that's one of the most important things that happened during the pandemic. You know, we link up with. Uh, Super talented people in the industry, Joka Carvalho and Tiago Nisa, that really help us build that ecosystem. So from there, um, from that talent side, we start just um, building new opportunities within the esports industry. So we are building our own dedicated uh, esports consulting branch within ISL. That right. is actually if we are working. With some of the best like talent in the world to build their their whole ecosystem. So you're no longer ISL football because you you go much beyond football. It's ISL agency. Uh, now it's we, we, changed, ISL we changed our brand three years ago. Okay. Once we we link up with with our newest and um, investors and family ISL family member that it's Bobby Epstein. Bobby Epstein. I don't know who's, who's Bobby. Bobby Epstein? Epstein is uh well the guy from Austin. The, Oh, that the owns this, that he owns the circuit of the Americas uh, within other business. Uh, so uh, he, he's an investor. He is. He invested in, in our business. Wow! And, um, Congratulations. It was like, honestly, the story was supernatural because uh, we were just in Austin with the sports commission, just trying to build our academy in Austin, and the, 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 the commissioners told us, "Hey, you have to go uh, see the MotoGP track." In in you know, and I was like, wow, that that would, that would be cool. And uh, I have a close friend just working in MotoGP. Ezequiel, no, 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 no. it's uh, you, we don't have to say names. Yeah. And from there, um, <laughs> I'm very proud. Es que me, me, me olvidé el nombre. Del uh, tío. Um, so from there, um, we were just there, and just like, very like amazing person came in. Hey, like, who is the guy from Barcelona? And from there. I uh, say, hey, it's me. Well, I, I heard you, you, you're looking to build an academy from FC Barcelona. And I say, yes. Uh, well, just come in. I, I didn't know who he was, and he was the, the owner of the circuit. From there, we, we become very close. And at that time, we were just trying to buy out our former partner, uh, McLucky, uh, because we wanted to move to, to, to a different location, and our business was growing. And from there, we... Everything just happened Clicked. naturally. Like, hey, Mark, I would like to invest in, in ISL. And I was surprised. Like, really? Like, okay, let, let's, let's do, do it. it. Do diligence. And in one week, we just become partners. And nice. We, and we you created an academy in the middle of the In the middle the of the circuit. circuit. Well, actually, he offered his location to, to build our base within the circuit. And it was uh, something remarkable, That's you crazy. know, and... and Super like unique, you know, having a soccer field in the middle, in the middle of, of the, the Formula circuit. One. Thing. It's a, uh, it was, it was something, like, wow. Like, so uh, you reinvented yourself through new projects. So like, what are you working on as, as the CEO, as the founder of ISL? So just to highlight, you know, for for example, the last three projects that we we launch or we work on. Um, La Liga Next, that it's the official recruitment platform for the best or one of the best 
uh, soccer leagues in the world. Wait, wait, wait. La, Liga. La Liga in Spain, Spain. They want to recruit in the U.S. Yeah. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, that's uh, that's what we're doing right now. So we built uh, a brand La called Next, La Liga yeah. Next. That the, the whole goal is just um, just recruiting talent here in the U.S. by doing different talent IDs and working with several showcases and tournaments across the nation. Locate the talent, send them to, to Spain to do a showcase to put that talent in front of all the eyes of all the sporting directors from youth academies in Spain. And then the best ones will have the opportunity to do a training camp with, with uh, Spanish, teams. Spanish uh, La Liga youth academies. I really believe this next generation, the 1998, 2000, early 2000 generation of Americans, they're going to be very good. And we I already have so. seen, like, or look. Gio Reyna is in Borussia. Christian Pulisic is in Chelsea. Serginho Dest is in Barcelona. Weston McKinney is in Juventus scoring goals. Musa in Valencia. Conrad in FC Barcelona. There are a well, lot Conrad of... Conrad on, on the yeah. Barcelona B, he's American. They're, 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 yeah, they're... they're he, played, he played in the big team too. Exactly, yeah. He did, like, recently. So, it's... Um, no, it's, it's unbelievable, like... Like so there are talents. The, you believe that. talents in America. You, there are talents in America. There is a huge talent in the U.S. The, the, the thing is, it's, it's segregated, you know. Um, uh, the pool for recreational soccer is huge in the U.S., you know. Um, the pool for big talent, it's, it's very tiny. But if you compare it with other countries, because the amount of people, it's also huge. Because if you compare how many people is registered in the Federation of Spain versus how many people is registered in the Federation of the U.S., it's like 10 million gap, you know? It's a 10, 12 million gap. So the, 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 the probabilities that you get somebody good in the U.S. are huge. There's 300 million people here. But that, that's getting into Spain. a whole different beast of understanding the U.S. market. That, that could be a completely different podcast because it's hours of hours of yeah. how everything is divided. But like in conclusion, you really believe in the future of talent of the U.S.? Exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a good way to help that talent. Uh, build um, realistic and legitimate bridges for them to play in the biggest one of the biggest leagues in the world, La Liga. It's a good tool also for La Liga to to put their brand in front of all this future talent and all the soccer community here in the U.S. and um, and it's also a good opportunity for clubs in Spain to just yeah to see talent to build stories around that talent. And to just really be in front of all the Americans that are really just super fans of soccer. So, where else are you working on? Right now, we will we close uh, recently a deal between Inju, uh, that is a technological company, with uh, Alaves, one of the first division teams in Spain. We did like a friendly with uh, Rens and Benfica. Um, and now, what are we working on? Uh, well, besides just continue to operating all the business lines within ISL. Uh, we are just creating all our esports uh, platform, yeah. platform um, by just helping brands connect with the right shareholders. Like, okay, I want to, I have a big brand wanting to organize a big tournament. Okay, we have the platform to do so. Uh, we have, a, I don't know, a, a gamer that wants to raise his brand. Uh, within other industries, well, let's organize a game with a soccer player. We have a player or a huge player just wanting to to build. Uh, oh, I know who the player is, but I'm not. I can't tell. But like that's zero. big. We can enorme. So let's let's build their ecosystem. And so with our team, that's what we're doing now. Just focusing on that. Then for the last month, we have been approached with different groups that are very big in the crypto collective and um, crypto collective like um, yeah but what do they what what do the crypto people want to do with the sports people I don't get it's it. um it's something very unique right if you mix art um, celebrities and limited edition crypto collective um, like art pieces you have like a Huge opportunity here. Why? Because let's imagine, right? I have a super big artist that is doing a super limited edition piece from I don't know. Let's let's say Pele, or let's say 
just you name it, Maradona. Maradona. Okay? Imagine that Maradona was alive. So that artist creates a crypto collective uh, like edition with art of your of that figure, and then that figure signs it digitally, right? And you can be one of the only 50 persons in the world that can have that piece of art with your very own celebrity or talent signed by him and with a, a specific blockchain code that uh, it belongs verifies to you. that it's only for you. for you. It's very speculative, but at the end there is a huge market. There is a huge market of collective blockchain world, before. Yeah. Like, sure. Not just... Ethereum. Yeah, I before. I it, Ethereum, yeah, exactly. So before it was... Um, People collect helmets. People collect cards. Physically? Physically, yeah, exactly. But now everything is transitioning to digitally. So that's a huge part for us. And we're working on several projects so that we're going to just announce very soon with some very cool people here from Miami and, and LA. Um, and I will say, yeah, that's a little bit it. You know, just building on, just connecting with more Building more brands. Uh, I'm proud of you, motherfucker. Because I saw you like... I mean, you came to this country with nothing. Like, basically, you came from all right family, middle class family yeah. in Spain. But you came here with zero money. Zero, yeah, dude. Was like, totally broke. You were totally broke. Yeah, like, totally broke. Like, I used to pay for your flight tickets. Oh, come to the road. I'll pay for your... Like, exactly. You were broke. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, and, and now you're like tens of millions and maybe hundreds of millions that, of dollars. That, not not Brazilian reais, it's dollars. <laughs> no, uh, Strong I, I currency. Mean, but, you know, the, for me, the, the, the most important thing is just keep it simple. You know, it, 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 that's... It's a little bit more minimalist, is right? Yeah, that's, that's... Everybody has it, its own nature, you know. Don't, don't change it because trying to fit it with, with a new group of people or trying to just, just reach to a new... <laughs> Nucleus, you know, or a new, I, I don't know, just keep it yourself. It's the best way to get into, in front of other people and other networks, other cultures. And that's, that was really the, the like, secret recipe, you know, like, um, I never had too much, you know, and I, I was where I, where I was, not because I was wearing expensive watches or I was driving expensive cars or, or just, Dressing or just wearing just expensive brands, I, I never needed all of this to to get in that, you know, to get into that or to to be where we are right now. And I'm gonna keep it this way forever. I mean, it doesn't matter how good or bad we we do. I will be always the same guy. Of course, people will say, yeah, it's very easy to say that once once you you reach certain level. No, my level is always the same. It's it was my nature. It's uh, so when I was Las when, Olas, when I was Las doing Olas. very good, yeah, life just goes go up always, and downs. Yeah. But but I always just follow my line, you know, and that's very important for me, and that's very important for for anybody that that listens this, this, this to this podcast. Is you can do very good, but suddenly you, there is a pandemic, and you have to go from Adapt, from one hundred to fifty, you know, and. And it depends how you want to see things as well, you know. Um, if you put yourself to where you are, that it's zero, because that's where we really come from. If you look at 50, it's, it's huge. Of course, if you, if you are at 50 and you want to look at 100, you're going to be frustrating yourself. So, and we always base all our growth not on what we generate, but on building things that really provide value, that change life. Like, like for me, ha having a kid that came through our programs that right now is playing in MLS. You are? Yeah. You have? That's, that's, that's much bigger than, for me, just... Wait, one of those little kids from 10 years ago in Charlotte? They, they're, and with the national team, like... What's yeah, his name? Tucker Lebley. So, that, that's, for me, like, more fulfilling that all the, the things that we can generate, you know, from, from that, and... That's what really keep us going, you know, like, I'm not getting into a new project because, oh, I'm going to make money out of it. No, no, no. I'm doing it because it's cool. It's something that is unique. It's something that 
I'll, it will, and it happens to make money. It, it, but first, yeah, exactly. it's cool. It will make me feel first. proud and it will fulfill myself. And if it fulfills myself, trust me, you sooner or later, somehow. it's going to happen. That's, that's for me. So, catching that bridge, like, think of like a young, let's say a young Brazilian or a young Spaniard who is kind of lost, maybe doing college, but not liking college. He's lost in life. What piece of advice do you would you give him right now? <laughs> Don't say follow your heart. No, no, no. I mean, follow your heart could be good, but it, I was not going to say that. I was going to say um, there are certain things that you have to go right. through in life to to make or build yourself, right? So, of course, you could be in college. You can hate college, but at the end, it's part of the process, you know? Right. There is people that follow other other um, other paths. For me, I, I didn't like college. I never liked studying. I uh, I, I, remember, you know, I, I remember. I, I, I was I, in the same I, classroom as you. No, I was like, you were a Poyot. I had I had it, but, la buena notas. Yeah, exactly. So, but people has its own way. So, so for me, it was like I hated college. But at the end, what that college experience teach me is that there are certain things that has to follow their own path and their own ways, you know? Right. And and then after you finish college, you are on your own, you know? Like, and that's where you have to take the risk. And you have to base the risk out of what is going to be a better opportunity for me, what is going to make me feel more happy, what is going to just grow, uh, what thing can grow uh, over the years besides just you being risky, oh, no, I'm going to get into a new industry. Uh, I'm going to become a project manager for X company. That's great, but at the end, you are just a piece of, of the operation. The so operation. for me, that, that was one of the main things, you know? Like, I never liked authority too much. Yeah, you I never, never had I like never liked boss. people telling me what to do. Um, I respect, I respect it, of course, everybody opinion and leadership but I I consider myself as a leader so I wanted to build my own operations you know I didn't want to be the just the wheel of the bicycle I wanted to be the whole fucking bicycle and I wanted to know who is going to be my bicycle you know or in the team I in, in a soccer team right so you have to find your space within the team right to really just provide value to the team so it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how much you have, but if you find that space within the team or within life, game over. You know, it's like I always say it. Like when I speak to to, to my friends or when when I go speak to to other people that is is doing business, I say, look, in in in, in every place you you have your your in in every single uh, um, stage of your life you. you have your own space, you know, and, and I compare it to, to, to FC Barcelona, right? So how is it possible that FC Barcelona has somebody that creative, like crazy, good crazy, like Ronaldinho, you know, like somebody that, you know, he was a leader, but a different type of leader than Pujol, right? That is somebody that 90 minutes all the oh. time, you know, that he was always giving you like a solid, Eight and a half, ten, whatever, over the whole, the whole league, you know. And then there is people that um, just with a little bit can do much more, you know. So just knowing who you are and identifying what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses. Don't be shy about showing your weaknesses in front of people because at the end we all have weaknesses, and the best way to to just improve those weaknesses is by sharing them with somebody that maybe your weakness is, is his strengths. And then from there, you learn something, you know? And the, the winning mentality, you, you never lose, you always learn. That's what I always taught our kids that come through our programs or anybody that I run into, you know? We could have failed. We failed in a couple of businesses, but is it either a loss or it's either a, a learning uh, yeah, the pandemic came. You lost, but like you well, learned, learned how to reinvent yourself, I, I just, and you're growing. I, even I just learned, you know, like I learned that 
I cannot base my business just on something that is physic. And that Did translates you know? into starting something digital. And what is going to happen that right now I have two weapons instead of one. And the, 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 the problem is that I hit somebody or higher. <laughs> Eh, es un placer, un orgullo ser tu amigo. No, tu germán. Para en catalán. No. Y yo estoy muy orgulloso de ver cómo has crecido tú, de ver que todo el ecosistema que has creado digital también es, es una inspiración. Ya sabes que a veces te digo que no tienes que ser tan controversial. Y ni tan fantasma. Sí, la, la, Siempre la, me ha llamado la, fantasma. La, es la, un teoría de fantasma. Piroca, la teoría de la piroca. <ríe> <ríe> Él dice que tiene 30, más verdad, tiene 20. Más 20 está bien, está bien, está bien. No, pero... Um, I'm so proud of you as well. Let's keep Te rocking. Quiero, we all know where we come from and we have to continue to kill it. É isso aí, rapaziada. Esse foi mais um podcast Mundo Rayan com o irmão meu. Quando nos conocimos? Dois, 2010. 12, 12 anos atrás. 11 anos de amizade é um irmão para mim quando eu estou em Barcelona. Não é aquilo quando eu estou em Barcelona? Minha casa. La casa é sua madre. Sim. Sí, Mama sí, Carmen. Sí. Mama Carmen. Mama Carmen. Um besito a Mama Carmen. Um besito a Papa Sagarra. Um besito a Plácido. A Pera. Eric Marçal. Eric Marçal. Another one. Another one that. It's, Eric it's Marçal. So proud also of him that what we have. Como a crescemos, from... né, cara? You know, I, there is nothing more refreshing than seeing your surroundings. Grow and do good. That's really que nuestra gente todos crecieron. Everybody, like, incluso los holandeses, el Sander, every, los jugadores, yeah. todos everybody crecieron. De nuestra and, gente. And that that what really makes it wonderful, you know, seeing yeah. your friends doing completely different, but doing good and being happy and just finding themselves. And that's what you know, next generation should do, you know, like. Eso ahí, rapaziada. Entonces, sigo Mark Sagarra. Tamo junto, es só o começo. Se inscreve nesse canal aquí. Valeu. Ah, e um abraço pro diretor. Vem cá, diretor. Vem, diretor, caralho. Vem, vem diretor. Cá, vem aparecer não, não. aqui, não, não, diretor. Tudo lá, tudo lá, mascareta. Tudo lá, mascareta. Por aqui. Quanto, quem é esse? Tony Belchi. Um, he's one of the biggest communicators in Spain, living here in Miami. He does all the productions, uh, covers all the big news here in the U.S. for media all over the world. He's a hero company, so big time friend. Big time professional. Vamos Thank deixar o contato here. aqui. Se você estiver em Miami, se você quiser gravar algo na Espanha, ele é o cara, diretor. Yeah, graças, diretor. Thank you, muitas gracias. É, muitas gracias ao meu amigo. Five, 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 five. Meus amigos. <risos> Todo. Venga. Venga, tchau. Tchau, vai tomar no cu. Vai. <risos>